All right. Well, we are in uh, the time of Pentecost, the, the time of the rain. And so I, uh, I think it's fitting that we should uh, start with a word of prayer and we will get into the message. Abba, Father in heaven above, Father, we come before your throne of grace and your throne of mercy, thanking you, Father, for the waters of life that proceed from your throne. We thank you for the spirit of truth which proceeds from you, Father, in the name of your Son. And Father, as we're coming to you on this time, the time of refreshing, the time of Pentecost, the time of outpouring, Father, we think of our great High Priest who is pleading for us and Father who is uh, pleading for grace and Father finishing the work which He has begun in us. Father, we do want to thank You for all that He has done and all that You have given in giving Your Son for us. So, Father, we want to acknowledge that great sacrifice, that, uh, that living rock through whom the waters of life come forth. Father, we need that refreshing. We need that grace. So we want to ask You for the latter rain. We want to ask You to fit our hearts, Father, that there would be repentance amongst our people. Father, that there would be a thorough work of reconciliation done to You and to one another by Your Spirit. Father, that's what these times of gathering, these times of assembly are for, and we need that. So Father, I'm asking also that You would take my lips, that You would take my mind, that You would direct me, that You would send Your retinue of holy angels that excel in strength, and Father, that they would be present here, and Father, that my mind would be clear for this presentation, that every point that needs to be mentioned would be mentioned, and nothing would be left out. Father, my mind is Yours, my heart is Yours, this vessel is Yours to declare Your glory and Your power because you've given us your Spirit. And we thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, before we begin, I wanted to say that this is, uh, this is a time where it's our privilege to gather together. And there, when we think of Pentecost, what are our minds brought back to? Holy right, he ascended on high, and then right, he he poured out his spirit in a great measure to yes. to the disciples, right, and they went out preaching preaching the message with power. It says great grace was upon them all, and David gave a message uh, just uh, a few Sabbaths ago, and he talked about the shortness of time. And I think that it's a message that everybody needs to see, everybody needs to hear. So if you haven't taken the opportunity to hear that yet, it's called uh, Judgment Day 2015, Yom Kippur. Uh, I believe that's what it's called, is it David? Yeah. yeah? So I, I would like everybody to check that out. I think that we're going to be touching on some points that we'll, we'll get, we'll touch a little bit on that, but it's going to primarily go into uh, new light. What is light? And... Uh, we're going to look at that question, what is light? And we're going to look into 1888. Uh, some of you might not be familiar with 1888. Maybe you all are familiar with 1888. Uh, 1888, though, was called by Ellen White, it was endorsed by her, as a loud cry and as the latter rain, as a most precious message. It was also the beginning of the message, which was to lighten the earth with God's glory. And she said that those messengers that came in 1888, at, at this time in a conference, the Minneapolis Conference of 1888, were the messengers to the Laodicean Church to awaken God's people out of their spiritual stupor and to allow the light to, to shine. So, because it was given such, a, such high honors by inspiration, I thought it was fitting that we should get into the message so we're going to go into 1888, and so as we get into the subject, we're going to see what exactly is 1888, why is it so important to us. Obviously, I just listed a few things of what it is. It has everything to do with the latter rain. 
And so because it has everything to do with the latter rain, it's a, it's a good subject for us to know and understand. And I believe that had that message been received, we would have been receiving more light and we would have been in the kingdom far before now. So let's look at what 1888 is. Now, now speaking of this 1888 message that was called a most precious message, Ellen White said, the Lord in his great mercy sent a, message, a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to His divine person, His merits, and His changeless love for the human family. All power is given to His hand that He may dispense rich gifts unto men, uh, imparting the priceless gift of His own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of His Spirit in a large measure. All right, so that's an important message, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Right, it's to cause us to see Jesus as He truly is, and it's to manifest His righteousness in us in obedience to all of His commands. And I believe that um, this message hasn't been fully comprehended, but that if it is, we will see Jesus and we will become a revelation of Jesus Christ, and we will receive the Spirit in large measures. Now, regarding 1888, she further said in Testimonies to Ministers, Now it has been Satan's determined effort to eclipse the view of Jesus and to lead men to look to men and to trust to man and be educated to expect help from man. Many were not looking to Jesus in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered. Therefore God gave his servants, Elders Jones and Wagner, a testimony that presented the truth as it is in Jesus, which is the third angel's message in clear, distinct lines. So this was a call to behold your God, right? To behold the Lamb of God, which takes away your sins. Now, it was further said in 1888 materials, God has given Brother Jones and Wagner a message for the people. You do not believe that God has upheld them but he has given them precious light and their message has fed the people of God. When you reject the message borne by these men, you reject, you reject Christ, the giver of the message. So who was the giver of this message? It was, it was Christ himself. He was speaking through his messengers. And now that message in 1888 was not received. Therefore, the loud cry wasn't received. Therefore, the latter rain message wasn't received. And it had startling implications. A.T. Jones had this to say. He said, what is the message of righteousness? The testimony has told us what it is. Speaking of the testimony of inspiration through Ellen White. The loud cry. The latter rain. Then what did the brethren in that fearful position in which they stood reject at Minneapolis? They rejected the latter rain. The loud cry of the third angel's message. So it was a startling thing, and that would be a great disappointment, wouldn't it? Jones and Wagner were, were sent from, as it were, to get, give uh, precious fruit from the heavenly Canaan to the people of God. And what happened? The, the leadership all rejected it and said, we will, not have, we, we will not have anything to do with this. They wouldn't enter into the message, and they didn't embrace it. Further in 1888 materials, it says, Who of those that acted apart in the meeting at Minneapolis have come to the light? and receive the rich treasures of truth which the Lord sent them from heaven. Not one. God meant for, for the wa watchmen to arise and with united voices send forth a decided message, giving the trumpet a certain sound. Then the strong, clear light of that other angel who comes down from heaven having great power would have filled the earth with his glory. We are years behind. The message that is to lighten the earth with the glory of God. The message that is to finish the work and cause us to see God for as He truly is and to cause men to see who He truly is through His servants was rejected. The latter rain message. But I believe God is raising men up now to give this message and the latter rain will go forward. Now, in first selected messages, it says an unwillingness to 
yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's messages through Brethren Wagner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world. As the apostles proclaimed it after, after the day of Pentecost. Notice how she connects this with Pentecost, right? That this efficiency would have been ours had it, this message been received. The light that is to lighten the earth with the, to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted. It was resisted and by, by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept from the world. That's a huge responsibility. That's great accountability. When you've been given great light, there's a great accountability that's placed upon you and Satan had shut away from the people in a great measure this light, the latter rain, which is the, brings the presence of Christ to manifest to all the obedience and obedience to all the commandments of God. In Selected Messages, Volume 1, it says concerning the message of Jones and Wagner, The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. God repeatedly says in His Word, the whole earth will be filled with my glory. And the glory is the revelation of His character, of His goodness, of His mercy, of His love, of His justice. And this message was to show the changeless character of who He is and it was to lighten the earth. Now, I want to look at the subject of new light. First off, we need to look at the subject. Before we know what new light is, we need to understand what light is from the Bible. So, as we look at this subject of new light, we're going to see, first off, what does the Bible have to say? Isaiah 8 verse 20 says this, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So, to the law and to the testimony, that is light. That is light that God has given. The law of heaven, which governs all heavenly beings and all things that are to, to be on the earth, everything that God has given. It's His law that is light. It's the testimony of His Spirit that is light. Anything that is made manifest in truth is light. Now, speaking of Jesus, it says this. It says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That is that same light that comes and lights every man that comes into the world. There's not a man in this world that doesn't receive light. There is, a man may have light, but he may not have the light of the law and the testimony and not speak according to that word that comes with that light. But that's the light that God wants us to understand, the law and the testimony and Jesus, the life that comes from Him. So new light is new life received from Jesus. And it would make manifest that if it's new light, it would be light on the law and the testimony. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Ephesians 5 verse 13 says this, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever does make manifest is light. So if something's hidden from your eyes, it's not light. Right? But when you see, you have light. When you have vision, you have light. You have instruction. You know the way you can walk. Right? If you don't have light, you might fall into a ditch. But if you have the light, you know where you're going. Now, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So God gives a promise. He says there are secret things, things which have been hidden, which have not been yet revealed, but that He's longing to reveal to us and that we may pass down to our children that they may receive a good inheritance. Now, I believe that God wants to give us something and it's a most precious experience that He wants to make us a revelation of Jesus Christ. But to be a revelation of Jesus Christ, to reflect the light shining from heaven, we must first see the light that is shining from heaven. Now, one, one such messenger had an experience and that was Wagner. He was in a meeting, in a hall, as somebody was preaching. And then he had this experience. He said, suddenly, 
a light shone about me, and the tent seemed illumined as though the sun were shining. I saw Christ crucified for me, and to me was revealed for the first time in my life the fact that God loved me, that Christ gave himself for me personally. Now that testimony is a testimony that each one should have. But it's not the testimony of everyone. We should see the revelation of Jesus Christ and behold the King in His beauty. But not all behold and are changed into that same image. But that message set the whole tenor for what this message was to be about in 1888. God wants us to see the truth. Now looking at the subject of new light in Gospel Workers, it says, We must not for a moment think that there is no more light no more truth to be given to us. We are in danger of becoming careless by our indifference, losing the sanctifying power of truth and composing ourselves with the thought, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. While we must hold fast to the truths which we have already received, we must not look with suspicion upon any new light that God may send. Because God will send light, but will it be looked on with suspicion because it's not according to your own ideas? Because when you do that, you say in your heart, I am rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing. But the message of Laodicea and the messengers of Laodicea were met to reprove that thought. They came with light. Now the question has been asked to me, do you think that the Lord has any more light for us as a people? I answer that the light that is new to us and, is yet, uh, and yet it is precious old light that is to shine forth from the word of truth. We have only the glimmerings of the rays of the light that is yet to come to us. So she says that, yes, there is new light to come to us. And that new light, of course, would be new life. New light on the law and the testimony, right? More light shining from the word of God. And it, she said, yet, it is precious old light to shine forth from the word of truth and that it was only beginning to shine. Speaking more on this, she said, said my guide, there is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. The message understood in its true character and proclaimed in the Spirit will lighten the earth with its glory. Now, I think that this is very important because the message of 1888 was to lighten the earth with its glory. Right? That was the beginning of that message, the beginning of that other angel, the final work to behold our God to make a people prepared for the Lord. And that was all about what Pentecost was, wasn't it? Receiving the Spirit to turn the hearts of the children to the Father in Heaven. Right? So that they could receive the adoption of sons when they received the Spirit, when they repented and were converted and became as little children, as Elaine shared with us a little earlier. Now, that message said that if it had been received, more light would shine from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This is what she says about precious old light. She says, The dust and rubbish of error have buried the precious jewels of truth. Now, how did that happen, I wonder? We'll look at that in a moment. But the Lord's workers can uncover these treasures so that thousands will look upon them with delight and awe. Angels of God will be beside the humble worker giving grace and divine enlightenment and thousands will be led to pray with David Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law, truths that have been for ages unseen and unheeded, will blaze forth from the illuminated page of God's holy word. Light on the law. Open my eyes. Cause me to see the light. Cause me to see the life from Jesus. Allow me to see Jesus as he is in the law. Allow him to be manifested to me so that I can reveal him. But it says the dust and rubbish of air have buried these jewels of truth. Now, the thing that is revealed causes us to see something, right? That which is revealed is to us and to our children. And I would tell you that had these things faithfully been committed to their children, and had their children faithfully taken them, there would never have been any of this dust and rubbish of air that would have built up to cover the precious old light that had already been seen. Now, how did this happen? The Christians had been committed with a great light, but there was prophesied to be a falling away. 
there was something that was going, they were going to cast aside the truth found in the Word and they were going to cling to pagan traditions and idolatry and they lost the light that God had privileged them with because they did not appreciate it. Speaking of this power in history, we read in Daniel 7.25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change times and laws. Now, when it says, this can refer to only one power, and that is the power of the papacy. That is the papacy. To think to change times and laws, there was only one power that had supposed that he could change God's laws, and that was the work of apostasy as Satan worked through professedly Christian believers, prof professed followers of Christ, to change God's appointed times, His festival days, and His laws, and said that they had authority to do so. But from the beginning it was not so. But to change the law is to change the light, and it's to exchange the light for darkness, because to the law and to the testimony. That's right? right? Exactly. That is how you dis you throw out the revelation of the Word of God. So he thought to change times and laws because the carnal mind, the unconverted mind, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So he was not subject to the law of God, so they lost the power of God and they started resorting to the power of the state and persecuted with this darkness that they had claimed was light. Okay, so precious old lights. I'm going to look a little bit about the rubbish of air. We're going to take that off and see light that shines from the Word. Anciently, the Lord instructed His people to assemble three times a year for His worship. Now, I want to ask you, how does, he, how does God instruct anybody? Through the Bible. So, He instructs people to assemble in His Word. Okay, for worship, three times. Okay, so it's through His Word He did that. To these holy convicts, <clears throat> to these holy convocations, the, is the children of Israel came, bringing to the house of God their tithes, their sin offerings, and their offerings of gratitude. They met to recount God's mercies, to make known His wonderful works, and to offer praise and thanksgiving to His name, and were to unite in the sacrificial service, which pointed to Christ as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That's what God wanted them to see from the beginning, is that He wanted them to behold the Lamb which takes away their sins. He never wanted them to look at the object that was before them, but to look at the light shining through that object lesson. Thus, it says, they were to be preserved from the corrupting power of worldliness and idolatry. Now look at this. I find this statement interesting. It says, And had they been kept as God intended in the spirit of true worship, in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship Him, the light of truth might have been given to all the nations of the world. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Sounds like Revelation 18 verse 1, right? Where the light comes and what the angel comes and the whole earth is filled with that glory, right? Lightened with His glory. That is the same object that was to be accomplished when God had appointed these three assemblies. The Lord saw that these gatherings were necessary for the spiritual life of the people. They were necessary. They needed to turn away from their worldly cares to commune with God and to contemplate unseen realities. Now, what is the spiritual life? It is light, isn't it? Right? And that life is Christ. So, when it was necessary for the spiritual life of the people, it is because at that time, they were to commune with Christ in special ways that they never were to before. And that the light of the glory of God was to shine upon them, and they in turn would give that light of truth to others. They were to, uh, it says they needed to turn from their worldly cares to commune with God, and think about this, to contemplate unseen realities. What were unseen realities? The promises of God. The promises that He gave in His Word. What the, the work of the Messiah. The work that He had promised to do for them, that they might receive the benefits of that. If the children of Israel needed the benefit of these holy convocations in their time, how much more do we need them in these last days of peril and conflict? And if the people of the world needed the light which God had committed to His church, how much more do they need it now? The light needs to shine in the earth to be filled with the glory of God. And if this 1888 message is as important as we, we see it is, that it's to be the beginning of that work, 
then we ought to understand it. We ought to understand it and what that new light is to shine from this, uh, this message that is to lighten the earth with His glory. And I believe it has everything to do with these, these feasts because they are times of divine visitation. Look at this. Let all who possibly can attend these yearly gatherings. All should feel that God requires this of them. Come, brethren and sisters, to these sacred convocation meetings to find Jesus, to find the light and life of men. He will come up to the feast. He will be present and will do for you that which you need, to mo- you need most to have done. These camp meetings are of importance. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Do you understand? He is the life. He is the light. To contemplate unseen realities is to see that divine v- visitor coming to be with us. Christ is coming to commune with us and to reveal precious things on these times of divine visitation. His own presence promises to be with us. It says, we should improve every opportunity of placing ourselves in the channel of blessing. Christ has said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. The convocations of the church, as in the camp meetings, the assemblies of the home church, sisters in Dallas, (laughs) the assemblies of the home church and all occasions where there is personal labor for souls are God's appointed opportunities for giving the early and latter rain. These assembly times, the times where we gather together, we stand in the channel of blessing. Now what does that mean to improve every opportunity of placing ourselves in the channel of blessing? It means to be where His presence will be manifested, where He says He will be where he will pour out the early and latter rain. What is this channel of blessing? Well, in Revelation 22, verse 1, it talks about a channel of blessing. It says, And he showed me a pure water, pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and out uh, and of the Lamb. So from the throne comes this water of life, living waters, which is to be a refreshing to Israel, to be a refreshing to the children of God, and to be a refreshing to all the universe who love Him and keep His commandments. Now, speaking of this, I find it very interesting in Ezekiel 46, verse 1, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, The gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. And doubtless this was for worship. Right? The temple would be open, the doors would be, as they are open, we worship at the throne of God. From one Sabbath to another, from one new moon to another, we gather before the throne. And what comes out of that throne? Living waters. So at these appointed times are appointed refreshings. Is that, you following? Mm -hmm. All right. Appointed refreshings. Now, that is the channel of blessing. It's to stand in the channel. It's to stand in the place where God is going to open the gates and when He will open those gates for those blessings. I made this little chart up here because a lot of people say, oh, those feasts, they are done away with, right? A lot of people say that. And uh, some people say yes, some people will say no. But it's interesting that Jesus, everybody puts uh, an emphasis on how Jesus has fulfilled the feasts. Now, I want to propose something. I want to say that by merit, by the fact that He has covenanted from the beginning to fulfill those feasts, that the blessings can come to us on appointed times by virtue of the promises that He is going to fulfill those things or has fulfilled those things. Do you follow? What I mean is this. Jesus Himself is our Passover. He covenanted from the beginning to be our Passover. So anyone who kept the Passover every year was to receive, if by faith, if they beheld the Lamb of God, they would receive the blessings, right? Now, it's the same with Pentecost. Pentecost, we we see this this grand fulfillment in that outpouring of the early rain. Now, that was manifested with with the disciples. So, what are we seeing at these times? We're seeing the heavenly gates open as Jesus himself fulfills these things. And by virtue of that promise, if we each year will come to the feast, we will, by virtue of what he promised to do, what he will do and what he has done, we receive the blessings in these times. We look forward to the promise of what he's doing and we look back to the promise of what he's already accomplished 
in the work of the gospel. Is that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it's interesting that in John 7, verse 6, it said, Jesus said this to his brother about the Feast of Tabernacles. He said he knew his time had not yet fully come. And this is what he says. He says, if you, if you do these things, show yourself openly. Make yourself known. Right? It's like, why, why are you hiding yourself? Come, right? come to the feast. Show yourself. And he said, my time has not yet come. But your time is always ready. He said, your time to believe is now. It's the feast. You can receive the blessing if you'll believe. You can receive from the open gates what, is, what I've covenanted to do. And I will do it at my appointed time. I will manifest it to completion. I will make all the conditions, all the provisions necessary to fulfill this good. You believe. That is your job. And you will receive the blessing too. My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. That's what he says to each and every soul year after year. Your time is always ready. Will you believe? So that Christ connection, he covenanted to make himself a human. And by virtue of that, anyone who believed in his promises, he had connected himself with. By his humanity, Christ touched humanity. By his divinity, he lays hold upon the throne of God. As the Son of Man, He gave us an example of obedience. As the Son of God, He gives us power to obey. So He takes hold of the blessing from the throne of God, and then He takes hold of humanity. And He didn't have to do this at 31 AD. He clasped hands with the Father saying, I will do it. And by virtue of that, giving the promise to man, fallen man, they could have power to obey because of what the Son of God had promised to do in making Himself and becoming the Son of Man. So he touched all humanity. Now I want to talk about the channel of blessing examples in Scripture because I think there's a few different things that we can find. Now a lot of people like to say these feasts are done away with, but I believe God is still working and using these channel of blessings to give God's people appointed blessings to everyone that believeth. The gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth. But to those who do not believe, they cannot receive the power. They cannot receive the blessings because they do not believe. Now, in ancient, actually it was in ancient Egypt, God had, we, we see the first Passover, right? All right? And what happened at that time? Do you remember what God instructed them to strike the doorpost with the blood of the Lamb, which was to symbolize Jesus, right? That takes away their sins, that protects them from the plagues. And as a result of their faith in, and obedience to God's commands, they were not struck with the plagues. But more than this, they got to see God's saving hand, His delivering mercy. And I wouldn't say that it's by virtue of the blood of an animal, but because they believed in God and what He would do. By faith, Moses kept the Passover. By faith, they left Egypt, not fearing the king. But look at those who did not believe. He said, no, I will not let your people go. Right? The unbelieving one was struck on that appointed time with a great curse. Curse upon curse upon curse upon curse. But God's people got to see continually more and more goodness because they were not struck with these plagues. They were protected. So here they stood in the blessing and they got to see God's goodness. They were beholding His glory as their great deliverer, as the one who delivers them from bondage. But Pharaoh did not get to see that. Now, another... So this was standing in the channel of blessing and as a result they were blessed. But the unbelieving are cursed. A channel of blessing example, let's look at Pentecost. It was on Pentecost that God descended on the mount in great fire. Did you know that? That it was Pentecost that He descended and He gave the law. Now, it's interesting that it says that the Israelites were afraid of God. It says though they had forgotten His deliverance and they said, He's, he's come here to destroy us. All right. So, the Israelites were afraid of God. They saw Him as a consuming fire, one who would destroy them. Because they did not believe in God's goodness, they didn't recount His mercies, they didn't say, oh yeah, God is truly good, for, good to us. They, did not, they, didn't, they didn't remember the blessings that they had just received in the former experience. And as a result, it says that they stood afar off. But Moses, by faith, drew near unto the thick darkness. He saw God as one who was to save and not to destroy. He said He hadn't led us out this far to destroy. And so it was, was on Pentecost by faith, Moses who believed received the blessings and he beheld the glory of God. So 
You see what these appointed times are for? They're to behold the glory of God and to get the light of the law. The light of the law. But those who who are unbelieving cannot see the glory of God and it is a curse to them. In fact, they started worshiping the golden calf shortly after because they were so so short-sighted. They were blind. Now, another example. In Jeremiah 34, verse 17, there's an example of a jubilee. I believe God has given this appointed time for a blessing to His people as well. Every appointed time is to be a blessing. And He had promised to let all the captives go free. On On the 50th year, also, all the land which had been sold was to be returned to the original owner. So they would never lose their land, their inheritance. God had made, it, pro, made a promise that through the Jubilee, by virtue of it, that they would, they would always have their inheritance. What God had given them would abide forever. But in Jeremiah 34, verse 17, Therefore thus saith the Lord, You have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty every one to his neighbor and every one to and every man to his neighbor, everyone to his brother, and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, to the famine, and I will make you to be removed in all kingdoms of the earth. Now, at this time, they were steeped in idolatry, and at this time of this jubilee, of this letting the servants go free, they, they did at first do that, and then they changed their mind. And they said, no, no, come back. We, we actually, we don't want to be without our servants. So they didn't give them the liberty. And as a result, God did not give them the liberty. And that was the liberty that he proclaimed. He said, if you say that you're going to give them liberty, then give them liberty. But if you're not going to, then I will not give you that liberty. Because you need to reflect my image. And he said, as a result, the curse came upon them. Because they did not obey and reflect God's way of dealing toward them who had delivered them out of Egypt, out of bondage. Deuteronomy verse 30, verse 19 and 20 sets this principle out that those who believe are blessed, those who believe and obey are blessed, and those who disbelieve and do not obey are cursed. It says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your seed may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cleave unto Him, for He is your life and your length of days. So he says, I set before you life. I set before you blessing. And what is that life? It is the light of men. That light that is to shine forth from the law and the testimony was the promise that He had given to them. Now something very interesting happened in the first, it was actually the second century. And I I shared this with Elaine yesterday. There were two developed sides that I'm going to show you just how important these these assembly times are. These blessings that we receive. Because the implications of not receiving the blessings can be drastic. They can be huge. So I thought, well, let's use an illustration from from history and see see what we can find. So Paul saw this, this unsettling of the faith. He said the mystery of iniquity doth already work. He saw the work of apostasy already starting to sort of ferment. And he said, let us consider one another to provoke into love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now he had written to this to the Hebrews and the Hebrews had their assembly times as their appointed times and he said, don't forsake them. Don't leave them. God had commanded them. They're, they're for you and your blessing as long as time should last. Now, the second century Christian church, unfortunately, only some heeded this command. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. And he kept the Passover. He kept the Passover. And he kept it on Nisan 14. He kept it on the day which the Jews and all the Israelites had kept the Passover. However, Anicetus, which was the Bishop of Rome, who is, they now declare to be a pope, was um, otherwise. He observed Easter, and he had a different day. He would observe Easter on Sunday. And so there was this controversy that just started coming between them. So Anicetus, he goes to Polycarp, and he wants to sort out some of his differences, which is a good thing. I believe we should all do that. But they didn't sort this matter out with the difference between the appointed times. Or they settled a few different things, and they chose not to break communion with one another. So the difference hadn't been that widespread at that time. God had still given light, <coughs> light and life to them, and they decided, well, we are brethren of one another. Now, something interesting, when you look at this little illustration between Anicetus and Polycarp, I have a picture there, you see this little grass, right? Now, 
if one place is continually getting the rain and the blessings, and then the other place doesn't get any rain because they've disregarded the channel of blessing, then one thing's going to happen to those who don't get any rain. They don't get any light, first off. They don't get any rain, they don't get any light. They don't get any light, they don't get any life. Right? And then they have desolation, darkness, death. Right? All right. Well, those who had inherited the faith of the apostles, which included Polycarp, were the Waldenses. They kept the feasts. Are you following? The Waldenses received the blessings of the rain. They received the continual refreshing of the Spirit. And so I just show, you see that these two sides, when they're developed, when it's young blades of grass, it might not look like much of anything. They're still receiving a bit of rain. But when that rain ceases because of continual apostasy and turning away from the blessings, there is desolation. Right? But that glory of the Lord is revealed when you stand in the channel of blessing. Now let's look a little bit about more about standing in the channel of blessing regarding the blessing and the curse. Zechariah 10 verse 1, it says, Ask ye the Lord in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. So God wants us to ask at a time. He does have a time for His latter rain. And he, the scriptures are clear on this. Now in Zechariah 14 verses 16 to 18, speaking of this blessing and cursing principle, it says, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So what are they doing? They're coming up to the king, coming to his throne, and they're receiving the water of life. Make sense? Now, I, if, if they don't go up though, they're not going to receive the water of life. Would that make sense? Right, they're not standing in the channel of blessing. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, upon them shall be no rain. So they receive not the outpouring. But it does say there will be something. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. So God wants to give us the rain, but he wants us to stand in the blessing. He will open the gates. He will open the doors. And even now the doors are open and ready for us to receive that blessing. But we, will we receive the blessing of the outpouring of the latter rain? Or will something else be poured out? The plagues. If the plagues are poured out, that's not a blessing. And we need to take heed because we need to get rain and not hailstones. Right? We need to take heed to our course. Patriarchs and Prophets says this, At these yearly assembles that assemblies, the hearts of old and young would be encouraged in the service of God, while the associations of the people from the different quarters of the land would strengthen the ties that bound them to God and to one another. She says this, Well would it be for the people of God at the present time to have a Feast of Tabernacles, a joyous commemoration of the blessings of God to them. Now she said, Well would it be for us to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, to have it, right? To keep it, to have the blessing of that. But she never said anything like, it would be wrong for us to do these things. We have, these have been nailed to the cross. She never uses that. She says they're a necessity for the spiritual life of the people. They're for the light, the blessing of the world. Right. Now, I want to show you something really interesting about that. Because a lot of people say, oh, they had Feast of Tabernacles whenever they wanted. I'll tell you, God doesn't have Feast of Tabernacles whenever, just whenever man appoints it. Right. Not that he won't bless in your ignorance. But there is a time of divine visitation. He will come up to the feast, whether you realize it or not. Now, in 1888, it's important to realize, the vernal equinox, it was on March 19th. <clears throat> March 19th. Now, the first new moon after the vernal equinox, I did this calculation because I wanted to find out when does 1888 fall. I mean, I, I was curious. So I did the math and I, I put it all on here for everybody to see. And it's super interesting. The seventh month, the seventh new moon, of course, is when the feast would come. You have the day of you have the feast of trumpets. You have the day of atonement. You also have the feast of tabernacles. The 1888 message, the latter rain message. I will look at on the seventh month. It was the sixth of October. The day of atonement started on the sixteenth of October, and the seventeenth of October. Okay, so so what, right? This was when the 1888 message was given. 1888 was when the message was given. So they, they, there was a general conference meeting in 1888 at Minneapolis and it started on the 17th of October. That year, at that exact time, was the Day of Atonement that the meetings had started. 
and Feast of Tabernacles went to the 21st to the 29th of October, and the Minneapolis meetings, they ended it on November 4th. So this general conference meeting went through all through the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, and the latter rain message was given at these meetings. Did Jesus come up to the feast? Yeah, he did. He did. They didn't realize it, but he had come there. Divine visitation. It was an appointed time for him to come. He did come up to the feast, just as he said, to give them blessings, and they had not. E it hadn't even dawned on their sight yet. Christ had to be exalted, and they had to see Jesus be in his true relation to the gospel and the law, and then God would take off his hand, and this light from the law would have lightened the earth with the glory of God. This is the latter rain message. Hosea 6 verse 3 says, Then shall we know if we follow unto know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as a morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. So he will come to us. And it says that he will come as the latter rain. His divine visitations are for us, and this time of Pentecost is a divine visitation. Now, Pentecost and 31 AD, I want to ask you, was it the last days? Because in Acts 2, verse 17 and 18, I want to make a case to you. It says, But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my, of my spirit upon all flesh. It says, uh, It shall come to pass in the last days. Amen? And it says, Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaidens will I pour out on those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I shall wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord when it comes. Now, said in the last days this would happen. This was a fulfillment when they received in 31 AD the Spirit. But did all those things happen at that time? No. So then we have a partial fulfillment of these things in Joel. So it must mean that there is a greater fulfillment yet to be seen. Ellen White says this, The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its beginning. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. The early reign is for the sprouting of the grain. The latter reign is for the full development. God wants to, us to get ready for the harvest and He is preparing us with His own presence. Will we shut out Jesus? Just as they did in 1888, they resisted the light because they said they're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Did they have something that they needed? Absolutely. They needed Jesus. They needed the gospel light, and yet they resisted it. Now, the time appointed for the blessing and curse. Now, do we think that God was done with Pentecost after it was fulfilled? Is there no more blessings and curses to be fulfilled at that time? I would say no. Because... It's interesting that the destruction of the Jewish temple, you remember that in 70 AD when the, the Jewish temple was destroyed? I want you to look at this account of, of the Jewish temple. It says, besides these signs, a few days after that feast, on the 1 and 20th day of the month of Archimus, a, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would be, to some, a fable were it not related by those that saw it and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. But before the setting of the sun, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding the cities. Moreover, at the feast which we call Pentecost, what feast everyone? Pentecost. Pentecost. As the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that, in the first place, they felt a great quaking and heard a great noise. And after that, they heard the sound of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. So now, it's interesting. God blessed with His presence and His glory to Moses who believed on Mount Sinai. And he would have blessed it with all the other children of Israel had they believed on the time of Pentecost. Now, he blessed with his presence in 31 AD to those who had believed that he was the Messiah, the Christ. And they waited for his promise. But do we think that's the end of the story? No, no, no. God still has appointed blessings in 70 AD. It was Pentecost. And the blessing that they should have received had they received Christ, they would have received that blessing in 31 AD. They would have received him as the early rain. Instead, 
What happens? Because of continual rejection, because they resist the light that God wants to give them, let us depart. So instead of Him coming to us as a rain, He was departing from them and leaving them dry. And then destruction came to the temple. The blessing was given to the Christians, however. This is what happened. The destruction came over the temple and Jerusalem when God had removed His protecting hand. It said, Not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had given His disciples warning, and all who believed His words watched for the promised sign. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, said Jesus, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. What is the desolation? It is the taking away of the presence of God. Your house is left unto you desolate. Let us depart hence. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart there out. Luke 21, verses 20 and 21. Now this is very interesting. And for the reason that is just this. It was Pentecost when they received a sign. It was Pentecost that they, were a lot, they left and they were gathered together. They assembled to the mountains of Judea and Jesus was with them. Jesus departed from Jerusalem when the destruction came, but all his disciples, all his followers departed as well. So the, the voice of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the children, the light of the candle had forsaken Jerusalem. There was no light to be found, no life to be found because they had rejected the Messiah. Those who lived just prior to the second appearing of Christ may expect a large measure of His Holy Spirit. If God has ever spoken by me, some of our leading men are going over the same ground of refusing the message of mercy as the Jews did in the time of Christ. Can this be afforded? Can, can we do that? If they turn away, they will fail to meet the high and holy claims of God for this important time. They will fail to fulfill the sacred obligations that He has entrusted to them. Now God has entrusted to them light. To the, I would say to the general conference to whom it came, it said that because they had resisted it, it was shut out from the world and the world was not lightened with the glory of God. They did not behold the glory of God and they did not reveal the glory of God. God's blessings were withheld at the time of tabernacles. And that itself was a curse because they did not receive the blessings of the appointed time. Right? They did not receive the refreshing which would have saved the world and they would have, it would have fulfilled the work. It would have finished it. He had entrusted that to them. And remember, as the Jews did when they rejected that message of mercy, there is a time when mercy will be no more. David talked about that the other day. And that's what's going to happen. Time will be no more. And this is what it says. This is the great day of atonement. And our advocate is standing before the Father, pleading as our intercessor, unless we enter the sanctuary above and unite with Christ in working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, we shall be weighed in the balances of the sanctuary and she shall be found wanting. So it's interesting that she refers to weighing, being weighed in the balances of the sanctuary and being pronounced wanting in connection with the Day of Atonement. When those who were filthy were filthy still, those who were holy, they were holy still. There was a separation that was to occur. God's people were to be made manifest as well as those who were otherwise. So the great day of atonement found wanting. And this is what she says. She says, in the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist church is to be weighed. She will be judged by the privileges and advantage, advantages that she has had. If her spiritual experience does not correspond to the advantages that Christ at infinite cost has bestowed on her, if the blessings conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her, on her will be pronounced the sentence found wanting. The light bestowed, the opportunities given, she will be judged. That blessing that she was supposed to receive was the atonement. She was supposed to receive the light of the presence of God and the light of the knowledge of the glory of God to fill the whole earth in 1888. But that did not happen. What was entrusted to her was resisted. It was shut out. And that is why it was a message that was given to Laodicea. But it said, because you said you are rich in increase of goods and have need of nothing, I will spew you out of my mouth. I will not confess you to my Father and you will not be found in my body. This is what Jesus says. If you deny him, he will also deny you. Now, speaking of the latter rain, she says, There is to be in the churches a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, but it will not move upon those who have not humbled themselves before the Lord 
and open the door of their heart by confession and repentance. So the door is shut. Jesus is outside, standing at the door, knocking. The light of the world, standing outside. And they are in blindness, darkness. In the manifestation of that power that lightens the earth with the glory of God, they will see something that which in their blindness they think is dangerous. Something which will arouse their fears and they will brace themselves to resist it. You see that resistance that happened in 1888 to the latter rain? How much more when they see that the feasts are being given and we're saying that this is the latter rain message, this is the channel of blessing, this is the time to receive the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. It is a divine visitation. If they did not understand the divine visitation in 1888, how are they going to understand in the Day of Atonement when their visitation is, when it, when it happens? They will not. They will be in their blindness because they say they're rich and increase of goods, have need of nothing. They are scared. They resist it because of unbelief. Because the Lord does not work according to their expectations and ideals, they will oppose the work. Why, they say, should we not know the Spirit of God when we have been in the work so many years? Because they did not respond to the warnings, the entreaties of the messages of God, but persistently said, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But poor souls, then they realize they need everything. We need every God-given ray that He sends to us. And then if we walk in the light, He will give us more light. We will receive the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and the new life that He wants for us. In Mark 13, verse 14, this is a very small text, it says, because I believe that this day of atonement, right, we're supposed to see a promised sign and a blessing and a curse at, the, at, at that time when there was a promised sign to flee Jerusalem. A blessing to the Christians who believed, a curse to the unbelieving Jews. There was a desolation, a departing of the presence of God. There was no light in her midst any longer of the law and the testimony. Mark 13, verse 14, it says, When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. Now, I believe that God is still using these appointed times more than just 70 A.D., more than just 1888. I believe He's doing the same thing today. And that if it's supposed to be, uh, at 70 A.D., was supposed to be a sign of the, what it's like at the end of the world, we should expect something at the end of the world to equate to that sign. Well, it's interesting, when he talks about the abomination of desolation, standing where it ought not, we looked at the papacy, changing that light, and remember they re didn't receive the rain, and therefore they were desolate, right? We looked at Anicetus, right? Now it says this of the papacy and the prophecies. So this, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Now, this is referring to the deadly wound sustained by the papacy when it lost its influence over the, the kings of the earth. That this was made, um, this happened by, because of the presence of God, because of the gospel. The sword of the gospel made it so that there could be a decided protest against her excesses and against her darkness. Light had shone and God's people received it. They didn't resist the light. And as a result, the papacy's power was wounded because people became decidedly bold against her. But men, because they've lost the light, they're blind, says they wander after the beast. And now people are loving the papacy. The kings of the earth are inviting her to speak in their courts. They're, she's standing where she ought not. And she's reigning where she shouldn't be. And it says this about those who wander after the beast. This is a startling condition. It says, They that dwell on the earth shall wander. Why? Whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. The reason that they wander is that they are not written in the book of life. And if they are not written in the book of life, it's because they have not received the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, which is that life. They have not beheld the Lamb of God, which takes away their sins. Therefore, instead of the blessing, they will receive the curse. In the Day of Atonement, this year, I think it's notable to mention that in a Protestant government, the papacy is going to be standing. He's going to be presenting his message in full. And it's, it, we're living, in the, as far as the United States is concerned, it is a time of great crisis. So to have uh, a figurehead 
that is speaking about peace and safety, it really smooths over the fears of the people and it really warms their hearts. And they wonder after, with admiration, after this, after this beast. But it's because they do not understand the nature of this beast, sudden destruction comes upon them. It says that they are lost when they do these things, when they wonder. When the papacy is speaking at, at Congress, that is the leading legislative body of the United States of America. When the, he's standing in the very heart of the place that's supposed to be protecting religious liberty, liberty of conscience, that is the Protestant principle. People can believe the Bible, they can believe, they can worship however they want. They can worship a potato if they wanted to. That's their right. Right? And God has given that to them. If people, He gives them an, a period of mercy because He is long suffering and patient, not willing that any should perish. But He doesn't leave it in the hands of men to judge other men and their consciences. So He gives liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But the papacy, where the papacy is, there is no liberty. And the fact that the papacy is speaking in legislative body is, an, is but a sign to God's people if we will recognize it on the Day of Atonement. What is the blessing to us? That we recognize that the Protestant government, liberty of conscience, is about to be taken away. And this is a sign to us to get out of the cities. It's time to leave. And so, it's time to flee Judea. It's time to flee Jerusalem. It's time to flee to the mountains. It's time to go into the countries. It's time to start gardening. It's time to start doing things, getting into the Word, understanding it, proving all things. The Day of Atonement is a great curse to those who are in Congress because they invited the papacy. It shows that they are lost. But to those who are saved, they recognize what's going on. And it is a warning for us that God is our deliverer and He's going to deliver us from this. He will save us. But the, the fact of the matter is that probation is closing and Satan is trying to keep people deceived so that the, the, uh, the gospel will be hidden from their eyes. Right? If he can keep it hidden, then the light and life of Jesus is not going to shine to them. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to block out the light and keep them blinded until it's too late. And then when they go and they try and find the light, it's going to be too late. P people are putting it afar off. Jesus is returning soon and we need to be ready. And these appointed times are the blessing for us. And the presence of God is going to lead us. He's going to guide us. He's going to direct us. And we see these things in His Word. We need to receive the blessings of these appointed times. And the Day of Atonement is to be a blessing to us. God still works His blessings on these times. And those who do not know... These blessings, those who do not know the life, those who do not know Christ, because they are not in Christ, they receive a curse. They receive eventually the plagues. Point. If they fail to come out, they will receive the plagues. If they fail to come out, absolutely. But but what is what are they coming out of? God says, yeah, God says to come out of her. What what is coming out? It's like Jerusalem. When, remember Jerusalem, what happened with the disciples when they obeyed the word? They came out of Jerusalem. Come out of her, my people. It's time to come out. It's time to believe God's word. It's time to believe and obey the gospel. Because there's no time left. There's no time. Time is no more. It sets forth this principle in Isaiah 66 verse 5. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that persecuted you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Those who have disfellowshipped you for believing in the feasts, those of you who have professed the third angel's message, and they are casting you out, those who are contending for the faith once delivered to the saints, God bless you. <laughs> God give you that blessing because He says He shall appear, He shall be revealed to your joy. He will visit you with blessing. But to them, when He appears, it will be to their shame. To be born of the Spirit. Now, this is, this is my last, uh, last point. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, But if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not you believe not, you cannot receive the blessing of believing. Lest the light, 
what is the light, everyone? What did we say that the light was? It is the, it is the, the life of Jesus, right? Light in the law and the gospel, lest, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And for that reason, because they're not standing in the channel of blessing and receiving those blessings God wants to give to them, they don't receive the light. Instead, the light which would transform them into that same image from glory to glory, to be a revelation of Jesus Christ, the image of God. Instead, they become an image of a corruptible beast. And they do not see God's glory. So therefore, this is the call. In Acts 3.21, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The visitation is today. Today is Pentecost. Is there any excuse why we shouldn't repent? Is there any excuse why we should have something barring the door from opening to His glorious presence and stopping us from reflecting that glory to the world? There's not one reason why we shouldn't receive the blessing today. It is one of the last Pentecosts, I believe, that we are going to have, just as David has said. And we need to know our God. We need to behold Him. We need to behold His glory. We need to see the light shining from the gospel of righteousness. We need to see the light shining from the law. We need to see the blessings and behold the King in His beauty. In the feasts, we will behold Jesus and what He has done for us and what He will do for us. And we will receive as a channel, as a spring of life, as we gather before the throne of God by faith, the refreshing from His presence. That's it. Let's have a word of prayer. Have a Father in heaven above. Father, we confess that you, you are a good God who loves us, who's promised good things to your children and you cannot lie. Pray, Father, that you'll take our lives and make them completely yours. Father, that we would recognize the cross of Christ as our cross. And Father, that we would recognize the reality that we are dead to the world and the world is dead to us, that we might receive the blessing of life, the blessing of light from your presence. Father, thank you for this time of refreshing from your presence. Thank you, Father, for the promise of the early and latter rain. And Father, that you have promised power to your children. Father, I pray you will teach us, that you will guide us, that you will give us of this rain. Father, we, it's rain we want, but more than this, it's rain that we need. It's necessary for our spiritual life. So, Father, please grow us. Allow us to abound in good fruits to your glory. And, Father, that we might walk humbly with you, and that we might have that love, that joy, that peace. But, Father, to those who don't know you, I pray that you might, might please give them entreaties, that you might warn them, that you might draw them into the channel of blessing in some way that they might be saved, that they might catch a glimpse of your glory and see your goodness. Father, please spare nothing to save these, these poor souls who are wandering after a lie, who do not know you. Father, we ask that everyone might know you. Father, we ask that we might reveal that knowledge to others. So, Father, at this appointed time, we we believe your promises. We say that they are yea and amen in your beloved Son, and that they are to us, your children, who you have bought with a price, you have redeemed. And Father, cleanse us from all secret sins, all of the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, and prepare us and use us to prepare others for the return of Jesus. Father, give us wisdom to this end. Enlighten the earth with your glory, we pray. In the name of your holy Son, Jesus, we do pray these things. Amen.